In this section, we'll look at the eye and its surroundings. We've already seen the nerves of the orbital region in part three of this tape. In this section, we'll first look at the bony features of the orbital cavity, then we'll look at the eye itself, then at the eye muscles, and lastly, the eyelids and lacrimal apparatus. Let's start with the bones. This is the bony orbit, or orbital cavity. It's described as having a roof, a floor, a medial wall, and a lateral wall. The rim of the orbit is called the orbital margin. It's thick and clearly defined above, laterally, and below. Here, medially, the orbital margin is less distinct. The medial wall of the orbit blends with the contours of the nose and the central part of the forehead. The orbital margin curves distinctly backwards, both above and below. Because of this, the orbital margin is much further back laterally than it is medially. This reflects an important fact about the orbital cavity it doesn't face directly forwards. We can see this best in a skull in which the roof of the orbit has been removed. This lets us look down into the orbit from above. The medial wall of the orbit faces directly forward, but the lateral wall is angled outward by about 45 degrees, so that the center line of the orbit is a little over 20 degrees off the midline. As we saw in tape 4, several bones are involved in forming the orbit. Starting medially, this is part of the ethmoid bone, this is the underside of the frontal bone, this is the zygomatic bone, this is part of the maxilla, so is this, and this is the lacrimal bone. Back here are the greater and lesser wings of the sphenoid bone. Here at the narrow apex of the orbit are the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure. The optic canal transmits the optic nerve and ophthalmic artery. The superior orbital fissure transmits the other nerves that enter the orbit and the superior orbital vein. In the living body, the inferior orbital fissure, which forms an apparent gap between the floor and the lateral wall, is bridged over with fibrous tissue. This groove, the lacrimal groove, leads downwards into the opening for the nasolacrimal duct, which takes tears to the nasal cavity. The rim of the lacrimal groove is formed by the posterior lacrimal crest behind and the anterior lacrimal In this section on the ear, we'll look mainly at the external and middle ear. The inner ear is so delicate and so completely encased in hard bone that it can't be well shown by dissection. We'll start with the external ear. The external ear consists of the auricle, which projects from the side of the head, and the external auditory meatus, or ear canal, which passes inwards to the tympanic membrane. We look at the auricle first. The folded outer rim of the auricle is the helix. The helix spirals down into the floor of the central concavity, the concha. The rim of the concha is defined by this curved ridge, the antihelix. Two projections, the tragus and the antitragus, partly hide the entrance to the external auditory meatus. The shape of the upper three quarters of the auricle is determined by the cartilage that forms its framework. We'll divide the auricle along this line to see the cartilage. Here's the cut edge of the auricular cartilage. It's highly elastic. The skin of the auricle is attached to the cartilage closely on the front, less closely on the back. The lowest part of the auricle, the lobule, contains no cartilage. To look at the external auditory meatus, we'll remove the auricle and the surrounding skin. 
The external auditory meatus is lined with skin. It isn't straight. It curves slightly upwards, then slightly backwards. The external meatus ends medially at the eardrum or tympanic membrane. This is part of the tympanic membrane. We'll see all of it in a minute. The outer part of the external meatus is supported by a partial tube of cartilage. Here's the cut edge of the cartilage. It's continuous with the cartilage of the auricle. To see it better, we'll remove the surrounding soft tissue. Here's the cartilage of the external auditory meatus. It extends much further below than it does above. To see where we are, we'll take a look at the same area in a dry skull. Here's the bony opening of the external auditory meatus. The cartilage of the external meatus is attached to bone here. Here's the beginning of the zygomatic arch. Here, just below it, is the temporomandibular joint. The condyle and neck of the mandible lie just in front of the external auditory meatus. Going back to the dissection, Here's the capsule of the temporomandibular joint. With a finger in the external meatus, it's easy to feel the condyle moving. Now we'll remove the mandible so that we can look at the external meatus from in front. Here's where the cartilage of the external meatus attaches to bone. We'll remove the cartilage to see the bony part of the external auditory meatus. This brings us closer to the tympanic membrane. Here it is. To get a complete view of it, we'll remove this part of the bone. This is the tympanic membrane. It separates the external meatus from the middle ear or tympanic cavity. The tympanic membrane is so thin that it's partly transparent. This small upper part of the tympanic membrane the pars flaccida is slack. This much larger part below, the pars tensor, is tense. The tense part of the tympanic membrane has the shape of a shallow cone. It's drawn inwards by its attachment to the handle of the malleus, which we can just see here. The apex of the cone, where the tip of the malleus is attached, is called the umbo. The tympanic membrane faces downwards and forwards. This is a true lateral view of it. When seen from the side, it's tilted in this plane. When sound waves strike it, the tense part of the tympanic membrane vibrates. Its vibration is transmitted to the malleus. The tympanic membrane is formed of a layer of skin on the outside and a layer of mucous membrane on the inside lying back to back on a layer of supporting fibers. The support fibers within the tympanic membrane are attached around the circumference, except between these two points, to a ring of fibrocartilage, the annulus. The annulus fits into a groove in the bone. To see beyond the tympanic membrane, we'll remove this part of the bone, leaving the annulus intact. This brings us into the lower part of the tympanic cavity, or middle ear. We'll see a little more of it by dividing the tympanic membrane along this line and removing it. Here's the handle, or manubrium, of the malleus attached to the tympanic membrane. Here below it, we can see how thin the membrane is. Now we'll remove the rest of the tympanic membrane. Here, we're looking into the lower part of the tympanic cavity. There's more of it back here and up here, as we'll see. This is the handle of the malleus. This is our first look at the incus and the stapes. We'll get a much better look at them later. Here in front is the opening for the auditory tube, which connects the tympanic cavity with the nasopharynx. We'll look at the auditory tube then come back to the tympanic cavity. But first, let's look at a dry bone specimen to see where we've been and where we're going next.
After taking the mandible out of the picture, we've been looking up at the underside of the petrous temporal bone from below. To see the tympanic membrane, we removed this part of the bone. Here's the bony external meatus. Here's the groove for the annulus. To see into the tympanic cavity, we removed more bone here. This is the lower part of the tympanic cavity with the three small bones removed. This is as far as we've come till now. The auditory tube, which is where we're going next, begins at this opening at the front of the tympanic cavity. It passes forwards and medially in a narrow tunnel in the bone. The tunnel is quite short. It starts here and ends here. Only the lateral third of the auditory tube goes through bone. Its medial two-thirds pass through a partial tube of cartilage that's represented by this added material. The cartilage of the auditory tube is attached to the base of the skull. Its medial end projects beneath the mucosa of the nasopharynx. To see the auditory tube itself, we'll go back to a dissected specimen. In this deep dissection of the infratemporal region, we've removed the zygomatic arch, the ramus of the mandible, and all the muscles of mastication. The external auditory meatus and the tympanic cavity have been exposed, as in the previous dissection. Here's the lateral pterygoid plate. The nasopharynx is here. This is the superior pharyngeal constrictor. Its upper border is here. The auditory tube is up here. It's concealed between these two small muscles. This one is the levator palati, passing down above the free border of the superior constrictor. This one is the tensor palati, passing downward and forward to go round the hamulus. To see the auditory tube, we'll remove the tensor palati and the lateral pterygoid plate. Here's the cartilage of the auditory tube. Here beneath it is the tube itself. To see the auditory tube all the way to the tympanic cavity, we'll open it along this line and remove this part of the bone. This is the bony part of the auditory tube connecting with the tympanic cavity. This is its cartilaginous part. The narrowest part of the tube is here, where it emerges from the bone. The auditory tube enters the nasopharynx here. We saw its emergence into the nasopharynx from the inside in tape 4. Here's the nasopharynx. Here's the back of the nasal cavity. Here's the soft palate. Here's the opening of the auditory tube. The auditory tube, also called the eustachian tube, is normally closed. It's opened momentarily when we swallow or yawn by the action of the tensor and levator palati muscles. Occasional opening of the auditory tube keeps the air pressure the same on both sides of the tympanic membrane. Now that we've seen the auditory tube, we'll come back to the tympanic cavity. In it, we'll see the three small bones, the auditory ossicles, that conduct sound vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. So far, we've just had a preview of this lower part of the tympanic cavity. To see the whole of the tympanic cavity, we'll remove the bone that lies above and behind the external auditory meatus. Now, if we look up from below, we can see the full extent of the tympanic cavity. With the auditory ossicles in place, the picture is rather busy. We'll remove them for now, along with the bone here and here, to give ourselves a clear look at the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. These two openings in the medial wall both lead to the vestibule of the inner ear. The oval one above, the vestibular window, is occupied by the stapes. This round one below it the cochlear window 
is closed off by an inactive membrane. This bulge, the promontory, is formed by the basal turn of the cochlea. The facial nerve runs here in the facial canal, just beneath the bony surface. In front, as we've seen, the tympanic cavity is continuous with the auditory tube. Up here, behind, it's continuous with a collection of air-filled spaces, the mastoid air cells, which we'll look at in a dry specimen. Here's the tympanic cavity. In this skull, we've made an opening in the upper part of the mastoid process to expose the mastoid air cells. Here are the air cells. The tympanic cavity is through here. The mastoid air cells don't go anywhere. Collectively, they're a dead end. Now we'll put the three auditory ossicles back into the picture. They're the stapes, the incus, and the malleus. We'll start with the tiny stapes, the smallest bone in the body. The stapes consists of a head which articulates with the incus, an arch that's formed by the posterior crus and anterior crus, and an oval base or footplate which occupies the vestibular window. Here's the vestibular window. We'll add the stapes to the picture. The edge of the footplate is attached to the inside of the window by a membrane that allows it to move. Movement of the stapes sets up sound vibrations in the perilymph of the inner ear. The tendon of the tiny stapedius muscle, which we'll add to the picture, is attached to the head of the stapes from behind. Here's the tendon of stapedius. Its muscle belly is enclosed in bone back here. The stapedius muscle tilts the stapes backwards. The head of the stapes articulates with the incus, which we'll add to the picture. Here's the incus. The incus moves the stapes and is in turn moved by the malleus. The incus has a body, a short crus, and a long crus. The long crus curves medially, ending at the lenticular process, which articulates with the stapes. The short crus points backwards. The tip of the short crus is tethered to the wall of the tympanic cavity here by the posterior ligament of the incus. On the front of the body of the incus, there's a saddle-shaped joint surface at which the incus articulates with the malleus. Here's the joint surface. We'll add the malleus to the picture, together with the ligaments that hold it in place and the bone those ligaments are attached to. We've already seen that this part of the malleus that hangs downwards, the handle or manubrium, is attached to the tympanic membrane. In the dry bone, this is the manubrium. This is the head of the malleus. This joint surface, facing backwards, articulates with the incus. The malleus is suspended by two ligaments which are attached here behind and here in front. This is the anterior ligament. This is the posterior one. The two ligaments are in line with each other. The malleus makes a rotating movement through just a few degrees around an axis of rotation that's in line with the anterior and posterior ligaments. There's very little movement at the joint between the malleus and the incus. The two bones move together. The movement of the lenticular process causes a tilting movement of the stapes. Movement of the stapes is restrained by the action of the stapedius muscle. Movement of the malleus is restrained in a similar way by a second small muscle, the tensor tympani. Here's the tendon of the tensor tympani. The tensor tympani muscle is enclosed in a bony tunnel here above and parallel to the auditory tube. 
its tendon turns a corner as it emerges from the bony tunnel. The tensor tympani pulls the manubrium and the tympanic membrane medially. The stapedius and tensor tympani muscles act in response to loud noise. Their action helps to protect the inner ear from noise damage. Lastly, we'll add to our picture of the tympanic cavity one highly unusual nerve, the corda tympani. The corda tympani, a branch of the facial nerve, emerges from bone back here, passes between the malleus and the incus, and leaves the tympanic cavity up here on its way to join the lingual nerve. As we saw in a previous section, the corda tympani conveys the sense of taste to much of the tongue. Now, let's review what we've seen of the structures of the external and middle ear. Here's the auricle, the external auditory meatus, the helix, the antihelix, the tragus, the antitragus, and the concha. Here's the cartilage of the auricle and the cartilage of the auditory meatus. Here's the tympanic membrane, the pars flaccida, the pars tensor, the umbo, and the annulus. Here's the tympanic cavity, the vestibular window, the cochlear window, and the opening for the auditory tube. Here's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Here's the tendon of stapedius and of tensor tympani, and here's the auditory tube. I hope that in future editions of this atlas, we'll find ways to show the inner ear as well. For now, we're at the end of this section on the ear. We're also at the end of this tape, the second of two that describe the head and neck. In the next and final tape in this series, we'll look at the internal organs. Thank you.